We are continuing our series on the book of Daniel. As you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. This is God's word. You may be seated. Many of you probably have been tracking the news this week. I have. Um, what's been going down in Ukraine? Russia launched what they called a special military operation on the country. Um, and according to some news that I read, this is the, the largest European invasion since World War II. We've already been praying about that. We have connections to that, people who are there or who have recently come from there. We don't know where this is going to lead, when it's going to end. Is China going to get involved? Is it going to get really hot over there? Is this going to lead to World War III? Those are some of the questions people have been asking this week. I want to show you a picture. There it is. Thank you, Tyler. It says, uh, it's a a screen grab from a CNN video, it says Russian forces invade Ukraine. This was taken just a few days ago. Um, and the little subheading there says, people pray on the streets of Kharkiv as attacks begin. And you can see that right there in the middle. It's kind of hard to see. But there's a group of people kneeling in the streets, praying together as the attacks are beginning. Just think about that for a second. It's a powerful picture. I don't know these people personally. Um, these people weren't interviewed following this video. But what, what do you think, just thinking broadly, what, would, what do you think would make people pray publicly while their city is being bombed? What if it was here? What if it was you? This, I think, is what the book of Daniel would tell us. We're continuing our series through Daniel today. This is what I think Daniel would have to say in answer to that question. Why would people publicly pray while their city is being bombed. Testimony of Daniel is this, that the God who preserved the boys in Babylon through many trials could have never sent them there in the first place. And the same God preserving those Ukrainian Christians that you see in that that picture right there, preserving them in this invasion could have prevented the invasion in the first place, but didn't. And as one pastor said, our peace, our joy, our hope does not rest 
on being delivered from the trials or invasions or fires. Our hope rests finally on the freedom and wisdom and mercy of a God so great that he governs with meticulous precision all fires, all pandemics, all invasions, all deliverances, and all non-deliverances, so that all things work to finally magnify the fullness of the glory of God and all that he is for us in Jesus. God governs over all these things, and he governs over them with meticulous precision. To what end? That he would be glorified, seen as truly great, and we would be satisfied in that glory, that we would get more of him. God can deliver Ukraine from this invasion, but their hope and our hope does not rest in deliverance from invasion or any other trial. It rests in God, in him who perfectly governs all things so that in the end, the world gets the greatest thing of all, God himself. That's what Daniel would say. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to go through the fire. They're going through the fire. That's what we just read. Our our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are going through the fire right now. And many of you are going through your own fires, your own trials, your own difficulties right now. And if you're not there now, you will be. Daniel 3, the passage that we just read, is meant to give you a great hope in the fire, in our trials, in those very worst, unthinkable moments. You can have hope. So we're going to go with the boys in Babylon through the fire. That's how we're going to learn about this hope. And we're going to learn three important things. The purpose of the fire, the presence in the fire, and the proclamation after the fire. There's hope for you today here. Brother, sister, there's hope. No matter what you've got coming at you, no matter what's going to come to you, no matter what you're sitting in right now or what you experienced in your past, hope in the God who governs all things so that in the end, you get what you really need. More of him. Let's pray. Lord, we do continue to pray for Ukraine. Have mercy. Have mercy, oh God. We specifically pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ there. Give them a sense of your presence with them in the fire. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Russia. That they would stand for the gospel there too. God, come and speak to us here and now. We face our own fires. Help us to understand more from your word because we want to trust in you and put our hope in you. Come and give us good food, food for our souls. That's what we need in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, first, the purpose of the fire. Picking up our passage right at verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar is mad. He's smoking mad. This verse says that he is filled with fury. Why? Because the three boys in Babylon did not obey his command to bow down. They only obey God. So what does he do? He heats the furnace seven times hotter. He binds them up. He ties them up in their clothes. He doesn't want to waste a second. We want to get those rascals in the furnace. And then he tosses them in. Has them tossed in. And that's where the the story, that's where what we read this morning. Now, the Bible, generally speaking, talks about fire in one of two ways. For two purposes. The first purpose we actually see here, judgment. King Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's executing his kingly judgment upon their disobedience. God also uses fire as judgment. Probably the most prominent example in the Old Testament is in Genesis 18 and 19. It's the story of the sinful cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. God judges the cities and destroys them by sending fire on them. So that's the first purpose we see. The purpose of fire is judgment. The second purpose for for fire in the Bible is refinement. The prophet Malachi 
looking ahead to the coming of John the Baptist and to Jesus in Malachi 3, it says that Jesus, when Jesus comes, he's like a refiner's fire. This is saying that Jesus' is coming is like, a, is, is like what a silversmith or a metal worker might do with fire. A silversmith, a metal worker, is going to use fire to refine or purify metal. Gets off the dross, the waste, the bad stuff. You keep the silver, the gold, whatever it is, the metal that they're working with. Judgment and refinement. And in both purposes, what we see is that fire reveals the true nature of something. If it's faulty, fake, flawed, fire consumes it. If it's good, right, whole, true, God-glorifying, melts off those impurities and makes it more pure, makes it shine. And we see that actually in this passage. One fire, two outcomes. One fire, two purposes. Look, if you have your Bible open, look at verses 22 and 23 again. It also might be up here on the screen. I'm going to read it again. Because the king's order was urgent and and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the burning, fiery furnace. So for the soldiers that tossed them in, they were killed. They were judged. Judgment. And for the three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell in. Same fire, but not for judgment. For refinement. Here's what you need to know. If you follow Jesus, if you're a Christian, your fires, the fires that God brings into your life, your trials, are not meant for your judgment. They are meant for your refinement. The Apostle Peter, speaking to Christians in 1 Peter 1, said, Our trials, though they grieve us, are for a purpose. This is what he said, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The fires that come into your life and my life to test our faith, to strengthen it, it's kind of like working out. You might work out. I don't. You put stress hypothetically speaking, on your muscles to make them stronger. The trials that come are meant to prove your faith is genuine. It's meant to make you stronger. As you, as you stand those stress tests, you find you've got something more precious than gold. Faith that results in praise, glory, and honor at the highest levels of the universe. Whatever the trials might be. You know what? Trials come in all shapes and sizes, right? You know that person that is always bringing the worst out in you? What if God is actually using that person to literally bring the worst out of you? You know that challenge you're facing? Instead of viewing it as a dead end or a no-hope situation, start asking the question, what does God want to do in me through this challenge. Maybe you're sick of the COVID stuff or the political mumbo jumbo or something at school or something at work or something at home. Instead of acting like you're condemned, you're judged by God, what if God wants to use that situation to make you more like his son? It's the fire that makes us moldable, makes us shapeable. So is that pain or problem in your life meant for judgment? Is it meant to destroy you? Or is God wanting to do something in you that will make the heavens marvel? Praise, glory, honor when Jesus returns. Now, I don't don't want to just gloss over the judgment piece because that's important. There, there is a great ultimate fire coming for all of us. 
a fire of judgment when Jesus returns. John the Baptist said this about Jesus. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Hear me on this. Trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins before it is too late. There is a judgment coming, a fire of judgment. He is coming to judge the earth. Those who trust in him will be saved. Those who don't will be judged with unquenchable fire. Instead, let your trials, let this, even this moment, whatever you're facing, whatever is difficult and heavy, heart-wrenching, hard, let it push you toward Jesus. William Cooper, his name looks like it says Cowper, but you pronounce it Cooper. He's an old poet and a hymn writer. He, he said this, he wrote this poem. Trials make the promise sweet. Trials give new life to prayer. Trials bring me to his feet. Lay me low and keep me there. Let your trials drive you toward God to experience not judgment but refinement. Let trials bring you, draw you to the feet of Christ. Maybe in the streets during an invasion to pray. Your faith in him will shine brighter than gold. That's the promise on the other side. And what you'll also find as you go through the trial, as you go through the fire, is someone is there with you in those trials. Which brings us to the second thing that we learn. The presence in the fire. This is verses 24 and 25. Nebuchadnezzar is looking through the flames when he jumps up with astonishment. He does some quick math. I thought we threw three in there. Now there are four. He says this, verse 25. I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. A fourth man in the fire Something obviously supernatural about him that makes him say that he's like a son of the gods joins the other three to walk around in the fire. So, the burning question is, who is that man? Nebuchadnezzar says he looks like a son of the gods and later on in the chapter he calls him God's angel. Really, we have two options here. Um, some scholars think that it's, that's an angel. God sent an angel to be there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And other scholars think um, that this is what's called a theophany, uh, an encounter with the pre-incarnate Jesus. They could point to other parts of the New Testament where it might be Jesus showing up, interacting with people then. It's, these scholars think that it's Jesus in the fiery furnace with, these, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, to be honest, we can't be sure from this text who it is. We need to be careful to not go beyond what it says. But whether it's an angel or God's own beloved son. What is important is God is there. God draws near to the three in this moment of intense trial. Now let's just step back and observe something about this. God did not need to be there in order to rescue them. Them being saved from the fire wasn't like, the prerequisite to that wasn't that God had to actually show up. He could have done that without being there. But God personally goes to be with them. God draws near to his people in their trials. What a precious promise. Many of you know that we lived overseas in China for quite some time. Um, and then we were, there was a, a particular pastor that I was meeting with, a house church pastor, and I was riding my bike across the city one day to go meet with him. I rode over to his neck of the woods. He was outside of his apartment building, already seated on his bike, which had never happened before. And as, as I rode up on my bike, he just shot me a quick glance and rode off on his bike in a different direction. He obviously wanted me to follow him. And so I kind of tracked with him through the city. And he came to a stop in front of a, a little back alley restaurant. We parked our bikes, went inside, ordered some food. 
And he, he shared with me that earlier that day he had been tracked and then um, followed by secret police who then invited him into their car, took him down to the police station, and he was interrogated for several hours. They interrogated him about his church, they threatened him, and worst of all, they said something to the effect of, how's your daughter doing? It's a veiled threat. It's his, his daughter. He was in the fire in that moment. And he opened his Bible with me in that little restaurant to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 and 2. And he told me he was experiencing these words, and I will never forget it. It's going to be up here on your screen. This is what Isaiah 43, 1 and 2 says. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. Whether you are tossed into a blazing furnace, or you are in Ukraine this morning, or you are being threatened by authorities, or you are in the worst moment of your life right now, no matter what you face, God's promise to you is that he who formed you, who redeemed you, who called you by name, who you belong to, when he orders the fires of our lives, it will not consume you. He will join you in the fire. And it is in the furnace that you have the closest experiences with him. Spurgeon, Spurgeon said this, Beloved, you must go into the furnace if you would have the nearest and dearest dealings with Christ Jesus. Some of you have faced hard days and you have wondered, you've asked the question, God, where are you? I just want you to know that I've been there too. You may not see him yet, but he is in there. Let me just give you a simple reminder. We sung about it this morning. You belong to Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. That's who Jesus is. That is his name. That's the God who we worship in this place. God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to live among us, to draw near to you and me, to bear our griefs and carry our sorrows. He knows what you are experiencing. And he came to redeem us and to bring us through the greatest fire of all, sin, death, and hell, so that we could be with him forever. For those three in the furnace, I would guess that the greatest moment wasn't deliverance from the furnace, like the moment that they actually walked out of the furnace, but actually the greatest moment was the fellowship in the furnace. It was there in the furnace that they experienced the greatest treasure, the presence of God, God himself. One more story from China. After we left China in 2016, our team, the team that we were serving on, a missionary team, and many other teams in the, in the country were uh, kicked out, kicked out of the country. The police brought our teammates in for questioning and then booted them out of the country. One of the teams had a particularly difficult experience. The police allowed most of the team to go. Most of the men, all of the women and children could leave, but the team leader they kept around for several weeks. They put him under house arrest. And day by day by day, my friend, Landon, would walk from his apartment to the police station to be interrogated for several hours, and then he would walk directly back home. And day after day, he walked into this fire, this trial, wondering if he was ever going to be allowed to see his wife and his kids again. He did not know how long he was going to be under house arrest, if they were ever going to let him go. But what he testified to was astonishing. Nearly every day, when he got back to his apartment, it would turn into a worship service. 
the Holy of Holies. God met him there in the fire. He, he so tangibly felt the power and the presence of God with him that he told God, if your presence will stay with me like this, then I want to stay here for the rest of my life. I want you to receive this promise for you. He will be with you through your fires. How? What does that look like? It might look like my friend Landon. It might look like my friend Pastor Wong through God's word. It might be through the brothers and sisters in this room or someone else not here who knows you. Maybe it's going to be a timely sermon or a meaningful time of of communion or a long walk outside where you're praying, you're pouring your heart out to God. Maybe it's all of the above and more, things that I didn't even just mention. But he will meet you. You will experience him. And you will realize that he is who you truly need. So these three men, they go into the fire. They're met by God in the fire. And then they walk out of the fire. All the leadership gathers around. Not only are those three not burned in any way, they don't even smell like fire. And then Nebuchadnezzar decides to make a a proclamation. And this is the third point, the proclamation after the fire. He makes this proclamation far and wide, and he says these things. God delivered these three when they chose him over worshiping another God at the risk of their own lives. So if anyone speaks against their God, and this is a godless king saying this, of course, he said, I'm going to tear them limb from limb and destroy their house. Wow. Why? Why do this? There's no other God who can do what their God does. God, through this fire, through this whole episode, has revealed some things. God revealed that their gods, the gods of Babylon, are trash, and he is the true God, the true king, the treasure, the greatest treasure. The three go into the fire. God meets them in the fire, and as a result, God is proclaimed among all the peoples. This is what happens when God's people trust in him, whatever pathway he calls us to go. Their faith, our faith, displays something. When we follow him, and he's with us like that, our faith shows something. It shines forth the glory of God. Hebrews 11 is often called the hall of faith. Men and women, it's a long list, talks about very specific people and then more general. Uh, Men and women who have trusted in God through all kinds of trials. And at the end of the chapter, you can turn there if you want, Hebrews 11, the end of the chapter, starting at verse 33, we see two groups of people. Verse 33 through the first half of verse 35, this is a group of people, I'm not going to read it right now, but I'm just going to describe what takes place there. 33 through 35 describes some people who experienced amazing deliverance, including those who, through faith, quench the power of flames. That's what it says. It's talking specifically about these three guys. And that's the first three verses. The last three verses there, 35 through 38, those are the people who did not receive deliverance, but rather they suffered were tortured, they faced exile and death. But the passage concludes by saying, whether they were delivered or not delivered, they were all commended for their faith. All of them waited on God to provide something better than the fleeting pleasure of giving into the ways of the world would provide. All of them faced a statue, a challenge, a narrative that they had to stand up to. And instead, they chose Christ. What is it that they gained? What did God provide? Well, chapter 12 of Hebrews, he provided a a savior, a king, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross despising the shame, and now he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the king. He reigns. You know what God also provided them with? A kingdom. 
He established through that great king a kingdom far greater than any Babylonian ruler or Russian oligarch or U.S. president or any other earthly earthly kingdom could possibly offer. It is the greatest kingdom. It is a kingdom with no more fires or sin or sorrow or suffering or death. It is an unshakable kingdom. Do do the the, the last two years not teach us that our world is, just like Jordan was talking about this morning earlier, it is so fragile. The kingdoms of this world are so brittle. They're crumbling, crumbling, crumbling. His kingdom, unshakable. So whether we are delivered or not, this is Hebrews 11, going back to that end of Hebrews 11, whether we are delivered or not, whether the fire ends our earthly life or not, this is talking about me and you, we trust not in our deliverance, but in the sovereign ruler of all things who quenched the fires of hell so we will never experience them. That's who we trust in. That is who is great. We fix our eyes there on him, our hearts on him who orders all things, including our fires, and joins us in those fires, in those trials, so that we would receive not condemnation, but commendation, that we would hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. He he brings the fires, he carries us through the fires, and he brings us home so that we hear Well done, good and faithful servant. This is the life of the Christian. To trust in the meticulous providence of God who carries us through it all and is with us through it all. And as we trust in him, we put on display to the world the great truth that we personally experience that he is the greatest treasure of all. On that plain in Babel, two structures were built. That, that, that structure that Nebuchadnezzar built, the statue, and the Tower of Babel. Both were aimed at making a name for the people and uniting the people together as one. Those structures were built in vain. But what they sought in vain, Jesus did. Through the structure, the work of the cross of Jesus Christ, where he bled and died for you and for me, Jesus united God's empire, his people, his kingdom as one. That's what binds us together. That's what we stand on. That's the foundation of the unshakable kingdom, the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine this morning, they are, they are experiencing this with a, with a fire. They're experiencing that with a unique level of intensity. But it sheds light on our own experiences. Listen to the words of one Ukrainian pastor who chose to stay in Ukraine with Russia invading them. He wrote this just recently, just a few days ago. He said, while the church may not fight like the nation... We still believe we have a role to play in this struggle. We will shelter the weak, serve the suffering, and mend the broken. And as we do, we offer the unshakable hope of Christ and his gospel. That is it. That is experiencing the fire as refinement, not judgment. That's experiencing the presence of God in the fire. That's making a proclamation through the fire. This shows that Jesus is the greatest treasure. We will stay in the war zone. I have an opportunity to leave, to be delivered. I will stay because I want to make known the truth that Jesus Christ is Lord and he is king and his kingdom is unshakable, lasts forever, and is the greatest treasure of all. That's what I want my life to be about. And so let's pray for Ukraine. Let's pray for one another. In the fires that you face, 
The fires you're facing right now, the fires you will face. I know some of you come in here feeling like you are in the flames. In a moment, we're going to take communion together. We do that every week. And we do it every week to remember that Jesus Christ is the king who established the kingdom through his blood. And what it also is, is it's a moment for you to take, to reflect on your own heart, to open your heart to God, to open your heart to one another, and invite really God into the fire with you. This might be the moment right now, in, a, in a, just a minute, we're going to do this communion. This, I want to invite you, I want to ask you to consider, if you're in a fire right now, to just turn to someone who's near you. Maybe ask them to pray for you. Maybe that's how God wants to enter into your fire with you right now. Maybe it's something else. But that moment is for you to reflect, to think on what God has taught us through this word. It might be a moment for you to experience God in the midst of your hardship. I just want to close, take you back to that that Cowper poem one more time. It's just a beautiful way to end, I think. Trials make the promise sweet. Trials give new life to prayer. Trials bring me to his feet. Lay me low and keep me there. Let's pray. That's where we want to be, Jesus. That's where I want to be. I want to be at your feet. You are the king, and we trust in you. There is no other. The kingdoms of this world are raging, Lord but you are the king who reigns over them all. Come and comfort us in our trials. Help us sense and know your presence. And Lord, through it all, make us a testimony, a proclamation to the world that we would experience and know you as the greatest treasure and that the world would see it too. You're worthy to be glorified among all nations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.